Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to talk about The Politics of Jesus, or To Podge for short, by John Howard Yoder. Now, first things first, if I'm going to review a Yoder book, I think he was guilty of the crimes he was accused of. I've seen some people say, well, maybe he wasn't, or given the circumstances, but no, I think as Christians, it's important to drag everything into the light, keep nothing in the darkness, even if we're talking about someone who wrote really good books. Now, that being said, here Here's how I was trained to deal with books in seminary. Stage one is to bend over backwards to give the book you are reading the benefit of the doubt. Really try to understand its arguments. I had one professor who said it's your job when you're reading a book to be on the side of the book, even if you totally disagree with it. Stage two is to then criticize the book and see where the arguments fall short. Stage three is to then talk about the biography or the sins of the author if that comes up. I think this three-stage act of interpretation is very important because unfortunately some great books have been written by people who have lived less than great lives. Martin Luther, for example, was an anti-Semite. Jonathan Edwards owned slaves. Karl Barth probably committed infidelity. Many Catholic theologians have been aware of abuse and done nothing about it. Many Protestant theologians have been involved in abuse. And so if we're just going to throw out all of the books written by people who lived in unfaithful lives to Jesus, then we're going to throw out a lot of great books. This three-step method is how I read books. It's how I will review books on this channel. If that feels weird for you and you can't imagine bending over backwards to try and understand the arguments of someone who's done something really bad, I totally get it. This just might not be the video for you because right now I'm going to try to really understand him and give him the benefit of the doubt before critiquing him. Okay, with that said, ready or not, here we go. Now, the most important thing about Tapaj may actually be how influential it has been. Before we even get to the thesis, this book immediately sold 75,000 copies when it was first published in 1972. 75,000 is a crazy high number back then, especially for books in the field of Anabaptist theology. It was also translated into 10 languages immediately. And then in 2001, Christianity Today came up with their list of the top 100 most influential religious books of the 20th century. And this was number five. Number one was mere Christianity. Two was the cost of discipleship. Three was the church dogmatics, all of them. Four was Lord of the Rings, and then this was number five. And I think you could make the argument that this was the first single volume properly theological book on that list. Mere Christianity is great, but it's kind of culture and apologetics. The cost of discipleship is about personal discipleship. Church dogmatics is six million words of academic German theology, and Lord of the Rings is fiction. So according to Christianity Today, this was the most influential single volume theology book of the entire 20th century. So this is actually my third attempt trying to record this summary video. The first attempt, I went through each little argument in all 12 chapters, and the book is very well written. It's not one of those books where tons of data is just crammed into the book, but still going through each little argument leading up to the big argument of 12 chapters made the video way too long. In my second attempt, I tried to cut out some of the smaller arguments and speak more quickly, and somehow that video was longer. So in this attempt, I'm going to instead just talk about the five big themes of the politics of Jesus. These five themes are repeated over and over and over and over again. These five themes make up 99% of the book. If you want the other 1% or to read the little arguments for yourself, you can just read the book. But if you get these five themes, I think you will get the heart of the politics of Jesus. So theme number one, Jesus came to start a political kinship society, or the corollary claim is that most American Christians do not believe that Jesus came to start a political kinship society. To understand this, we obviously need to define our terms. What is a kinship society? A kinship society is any group wherein the members of that group have their personal identities wrapped up in community membership. A rotary club is not a kinship society. Chess club is not a kinship society. The Republican Party can be a kinship society for some people, and it's not a kinship society for other people. Individual families are kinship societies for many people. For other people, their personal identities isn't wrapped up in their nuclear family. So whatever groups you're a part of, 
wherein your membership in that group make up your identity, that is a kinship society. Yoder is claiming that Jesus did not just come to save you from your sins. He did not just come to teach good advice about how you can get on better with people and live in the straight and narrow. Jesus came to start a society, and the people in the society need to have their identities wrapped up most fundamentally in membership to this society before anything else they happen to be a part of. And Yoder claims that American Christians deny the fact that Jesus started a kinship society in a few ways. One is to turn church into a commodity. You show up on Sunday and receive a production. And it may even be a biblical production with good songs and good tips and good theology, but you show up to receive a product. That is different than being a part of a community where your identity is knit into the lives of the people around you. A second way that we deny the fact that Jesus started a kinship society, according to Yoder, is by reducing the gospel to a gospel of justification. The whole Bible is about you going to heaven and not hell when you die. And so church is made up of a bunch of individuals who have their golden tickets. I have my golden ticket to heaven and you have yours and you have yours and all of us as individuals with golden tickets meet on Sundays. That's also not a kinship society. There are more ways we dodge it that Yoder goes through, uh, but you can get those if you read the book for yourself. And not only are we a kinship society, but Jesus started a political kinship society. So our kinship society is political in this sense. We always must be reminding the governments that we exist under that we do not respect them or give ultimate authority to them. We don't dishonor or disrespect the people in charge, but we don't give them allegiance. We are always saying, hey, whatever government happens to be in charge of me, you don't own me and you're not in absolute control. And if you do anything evil, we're watching and we will call you out. Having that attitude in our kinship society of not giving allegiance and of calling out evil in politics makes us a political kinship society. And Yoder says that, again, Christians can deny this political aspect to our kinship calling in a few ways. One is by being too reserved, and we as a people will never call out evil in the government. No matter how egregious it is, we will never say that the powers of this world are do something, doing something wrong because that will ruffle feathers or that's too uncomfortable. A different way we can deny our political calling is to tie and marry the church to a certain political party. And now what it means to be a part of our kinship society is to vote a certain way. Either one of these, being too divorced or too married to the political system, is a way of, in the end, denying our political calling, is what Yoder would say. The second theme of the book is that Jesus gave us, his political kinship society members, real and concrete rules to follow regarding money and violence and other parts of average everyday life. The corollary claim is that we as American Christians are quick to spiritualize or therapeutize these claims. Here's some examples regarding money. Yoder points out how ubiquitous the theme of the year of Jubilee is in Jesus' teachings. I, as a normal Bible reader, had noticed that, yeah, Jesus talks about the year of Jubilee, but it is literally everywhere after Yoder points it out. Now, the year of Jubilee has a few components of it, Yoder points out. One is that you're supposed to let your fields lay fallow. Two is that you're supposed to relieve all debt. Three is that you're supposed to release all slaves. And four is that you're supposed to redistribute land to its original owners. And here's what Yoder says American Christians do with this theme. Letting your fields lay fallow means you're not supposed to offer your moral efforts to God, but you're supposed to let God provide a righteousness for you. He will forgive you of your sins. And relieving debts is symbolic of God forgiving you of your sins. And releasing slaves is symbolic of God releasing you from your slavery to the flesh. And redistributing land is symbolic of the fact that after you die, you will inherit heaven. And Yoder says, um, that's nice, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about a concrete thing that we in the political kinship group are supposed to do. We are not supposed to be financially savvy people who are moving around. We're supposed to wait for God to provide for us literal bread and literal money. We are supposed to not collect debt from people. We are supposed to let our slaves free. We are supposed to give to anyone in the group who needs land. If someone in our family needs land, just give them a house. These are literal, concrete, monetary rules that our group is supposed to follow. Don't spiritualize these. We can also therapeutize uh, Jesus' teachings about money, his literal money teachings. The big example of this is Jesus says, 
uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's how we're supposed to break. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Yoder points out how we turn forgive our debtors into just kind of be a forgiving person. You have to forgive your dad if he was a rough dad growing up. Or you have to forgive your neighbor if they're loud. Or you have to forgive your boss if they're working you too hard. And Yoder says, don't therapeutize that. Jesus is telling you, forgive your debts. Don't make people owe you money. Don't turn this into a spiritual thing about justification or a therapeutic thing about being nice to your mean dad. Don't make people owe you money is what Jesus keeps hammering home. A second example of this that Yoder points to is the take up your cross and follow me set of verses. Yoder points out how frequently American Christians take these verses of kill your flesh or take up your cross and follow me. And we use those verses to talk about dying to pornography, dying to lust, dying to bitterness. And Yoder says, okay, that's good. You should take up your cross and die to bitterness. But also, Jesus is literally saying, if you join our political kinship group, the Roman Empire might publicly execute you. Don't spiritualize or therapeutize this literal threat that we are starting a political group and you might get killed if you join. Now, there are many more examples of this in the book that Yoder goes through. Teachings of Jesus, where Jesus is talking about bread or wine or coins, and we're quick to spiritualize these and turn them into parables of the doctrine of justification or life advice for how to get on better with your wife. And he just says, no, take these as naive, childlike readers. Now, before moving on, there is another swipe that he kind of takes at liberal churches, which I think is worth bringing up. Yoder points out that many more liberal churches use the Jubilee theme in Jesus as a pretext for voting in socialism or communism. And Yoder says, no, you're missing the whole point. The Jubilee theme is how people inside the kingdom, inside our political kinship society, are supposed to live. If anyone in our group needs land, we redistribute land to those people. This is a, you of your own volition have joined our group and decided to use your land in that give it away type. Once you start voting the year of Jubilee into the government and the government is forcing rich people to give their land to poor people, you're, you're taking the rules of Jesus for our political kinship society and forcing it into a context Jesus didn't intend it to go. That's a small but important caveat he makes at the end of one of the chapters. Theme number three, Jesus renounced violence. And the corollary theme is that most American Christians make allowance for violence. And there's a few points that he makes here. First of all, he runs through a ton of Old Testament texts that are pacifist texts. Yoder points out that many people view the Old Testament as just full of bloodshed and holy war and conquest. But he says, actually, if you read the Old Testament, it is chock full of stories where the people of God lay their weapons down and God fights for his people on their behalf. Moses didn't kill Pharaoh. God killed Pharaoh. And I was shocked by how many pacifist texts there really are in the Old Testament. The people of God are told not to fight because God will fight on their behalf. Yoder points out that in a context where everything is dictated by violence, everything is dictated by who died in the last war and what we're saving up to prepare for the next war, a holy book that has so many pacifistic passages would stick out as weirdly anti-violence. We, from our modern 21st century perspective, read the Old Testament and see it as full of blood, but Yoder is reminding us that in a world that's literally full of blood, this book is literally full of pacifism. His second idea in this third theme is to simply ask, is Jesus more than our substitute? Yes, Jesus is our substitute and he dies in our place and takes our sins. Isn't he also our example? And if there is any sense in which Jesus' life and death are an example for how we in the political kinship group are supposed to live, then aren't we supposed to passively accept violence just like Jesus did? Or are you going to say Jesus is only our substitute? And the third idea he brings up in this third theme has to do with Romans 13. Yoder's interpretation of Romans 13 is that Paul is not saying the government is good. What Paul is saying is that the idea of government in general is instituted by God because it is better than anarchy, but all of the individual governments under the idea of government are fallen. All of the governments are totally fallen, but it's all better than anarchy. 
That's the thrust of Romans 13, according to Yoder. The second thing is, what about when Paul says the government has been given the sword? Yoder makes an argument that that only means the government is allowed to create a police force. Yoder argues that there were different symbols for war and for capital punishment, and that Paul is specifically not using those symbols, and he's only using the symbol of the sword, which is the police force. Now, like I said, after I bend over backwards to understand this book, I'm going to criticize it, and we'll come back to what I think of his arguments for pacifism at the end. The fourth theme is that Jesus had an apocalyptic social imaginary, and the corollary claim is that most American Christians have a humanist social imaginary. We'll start with what is a humanist social imaginary. A humanist social imaginary says, up there there's God, maybe or maybe not. You can be a theist or an atheist to have a humanist social imaginary. But down here, below God, there's humans. And when we get together, we create communities and institutions. And if we all try really hard and we put our best foot forward and we have accountability, we can build some great institutions, governments or militaries or universities or United Nations. We as humans, when we try our best, can come up with some great stuff. And there might be a God up there or might not, but then there's us and there's nothing in between. An apocalyptic social imaginary says there are demons in between. Angels and demons are a big part of reality. And when you came up with this whole theme of us coming together and making governments and universities, you forgot to talk about demons. An apocalyptic social imaginary says that all of these institutions have at the top of them ruling spirits. And since the fall, all of these ruling spirits are fallen. America is ultimately run by fallen spirits, the Democrat and the Republican Party, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party. There is a demon running the institution of Yale and Princeton and Harvard. The apocalyptic social imaginary sees demons as playing a much bigger part than the humanist social imaginary. And Yoder would say that even if you as a Christian believe in demons, you probably believe in demons in a way that is very one-on-one -on -one personal. Demons might tempt you to lust, or they might tempt you to be bitter or feel sad about yourself. That is still a humanist uh, social imaginary. If you start seeing demons as in charge of systems, that's an apocalyptic social imaginary. And that's the social imaginary that Jesus had. Now, once you start thinking of the world in this way, where it's not just humans coming together and making stuff, but it's humans coming together and making stuff, which is ultimately run by fallen angels, we then see a savior as needing to do more for us than simply pay for our sins. Yes, Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, but according to theologians who have this apocalyptic imaginary, they see Jesus as also fundamentally in his salvific mission, creating little safe spaces, little islands of reality where we can finally breathe deeply and say we are part of a community or an institution that isn't at the top run by a fallen angel. And the creation of these little pockets of non-fallen communities is as central and fundamental and at the heart of what Jesus was doing as paying for our sins on the cross. The fifth and final theme of the book is that Jesus played the long game. And the corollary belief is that most American Christians aren't radical enough and we're playing the short game. Here's what Yoder means. The short game says the way that we advance the kingdom, the way that we advance the boundaries of our political kinship society is by getting individuals from our group into positions of power. And we legislate Christian morality and we have people in high up places in the military and universities and places of cultural formation. And Yoder would say, that's not radical enough. Voting in Christian ethics isn't radical enough. The really radical thing is for us to all meet in our little oases of society and then go out as individuals into the world and simply live our lives without giving allegiance to the demons who run things in the world. Existence is resistance. Living in their world without giving them allegiance is the most powerful form of resistance that we have, is Yoder's interpretation of Jesus's vision of how we expand the kingdom. Now we get to the criticism part of the book. As for readability, I'm gonna give the book a 10 out of 10. It is very readable. I have heard other people say that they had trouble with Yoder's sentence structures. He has a lot of run-on sentences. I, for some reason, didn't find that off-putting, but if you don't like run-on sentences, maybe it's a 9.5. As for importance, it's a 9.8. 
Christianity Today would say it's a 10.0. As for agreement, here we go. I'm only going to talk about the things I disagree with. So if I don't mention something, assume I totally agree with it. The second theme, which is that Jesus gave us very concrete ideas for how we're supposed to live in our political kinship society, I would want to add that it is also appropriate to tie these literal rules Jesus gives us to their spiritual truth. We are supposed to forgive our debtors because God has forgiven us our sins. And so that spiritual theological reality is tied to the on the ground physical reality that we should really forgive our debtors. Now, Yoder sometimes make it, makes it sound like all we need to do is get the physical rules of Jesus right and don't worry about that theology stuff. I would wanna say that the two exist and should be tied together. The next big disagreement with the book is the pacifism chapter. Now, he really did open my eyes to how much pacifism there is in the Old Testament. He alerted my eyes to the fact that the theme of we don't fight, God fights for us really is there in bold in the Old Testament. But he didn't deal with any of the violent chapters. He didn't talk about the battle against the Amalekites or David versus Goliath. What do you do with the violence that seems to be condoned in the Old Testament? Also, I'm just not convinced of his interpretation of Romans 13. Now, here's another important thing to say about the pacifism that Yoder supports. There is a big split within pacifist Christians on the question of whether violence should be renounced because we leave it to God, or should violence be renounced because violence is just irredeemably evil, full stop. Saying we should not commit violence because God will do it on our behalf is one version of pacifism, and that's what Yoder says. But there are other theologians who say that we shouldn't do violence and God would never do violence either. And that's a totally different kettle of fish. And that's like a civil war within Anabaptist pacifism. But it's really important to notice that difference. Another version of this is that Yoder would say police are good. God has given the sword, which is the right to create a police to the government. Whereas other Anabaptists would say that we should defund the police. They've been calling to defund the police for a long time. Again, that's a big difference of opinion about the right use of violence in the world within the pacifist position. But overall, my biggest critique with the book is this single question of what do you do when we win? In other words, let's say we follow this political kinship society perfectly the way that Yoder has in mind. And we all really clean up our personal lives and we're committed to one another and we follow the rules of Jesus perfectly in our society. We go out into the world and then the world turns around and says, oh wow, hey Christians, how should we run the world? You guys are doing good. We like you, what should we do? Like when Constantine said to the bishops, how should I run the Roman Empire? This has happened a lot of times throughout the world. And it seems like Yoder is such an isolationist that he, he thinks that any interaction with Constantine or any interaction with the state can be nothing but compromise. It will totally dirty us to get involved with helping the state, even if it's on a small, like the education board of your local town, you can't get involved with the state without us getting dirty. And I guess I would want to ask Yoder or the more isolationist Christians, what do we do when we win? What happens when we are such a good society that the world notices and wants our input? Are we allowed to actually interact with the world at that point? So I'm going to give agreement a 6.577 out of 10. Now, we've reviewed the book and criticized the book. I want to talk about his biography. I think the gross sins that Yoder committed should not only be condemned as gross, but they should also be identified because they are tied to his theology. And here's, I think, the connection. Usually theologies that have a over-realized eschatology, which means they have a heightened vision of how perfect the Christian can be before Jesus returns, or a heightened vision of how perfect the church can be before Jesus returns, those theologies are usually tied to very real, on the ground, concrete sins, pornography addiction and drug addiction or alcohol abuse or stealing money from the church. And, and I think that just historically there's been that connection. And here in the life of Yoder, we see that again. If you really think of your life as basically perfect or the church you're a part of as basically perfect and you're the city on the hill standing against darkness, which has infiltrated every other institution, that way of thinking about yourself or your group leads people to kind of, it's okay to swipe under the rug little sins like abuse or stealing money. And, and that really sad connection just seems to re be repeated over and over and over all the time. And it's worth pointing out here. So I guess the warning here is to one, don't have an over-realized eschatology and to two, don't hide sin, but take it into the light. 
Now, that's my review of the politics of Jesus. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up, and I hope to see you in the next video.